pastor was preaching a message on Satan, talking about how Satan is so deceptive and all the tactics that Satan uses. And as he was preparing for the message, he got a devilish idea. Halfway through the sermon, as he was preaching it, he had a man come in with a cape, horns, a pitchfork, ran into the audience. As you can expect, it cleared the room out. Except for one guy who stayed in his seat and was just totally calm through the whole thing. The pastor walked back to him because he was curious. He said, why didn't you run outside with everybody else? He said, didn't that make you afraid? He said, oh no. He said, I've been married to his sister for 30 years. <laughs> Oh my, if you're not laughing, if you're not laughing, book of Psalms 85 and verse number 6, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Revival. You know, for some of us, when we hear that word, it automatically brings some thoughts to our minds. Maybe you think about revival meetings, and you say, oh no. <laughs> That's when the pastor brings in somebody Tells him all our problems and he's got a week to preach it out of us. And it really doesn't work that way. I believe revival is when the Lord begins to stir and move in his people. And I believe that there are times very clearly you can look back in your own life. You could say that was a time of revival in my life. I think even presently in America, I've talked to many uh, pastors and many friends of mine who have said that they have sensed a spirit of revival in their congregation. And I think that I sense that even here at church. And it's not because of something that we have done in particular, but I think that the last 15 to 16 months has certainly taught us a greater dependence on God, a greater need for prayer, becoming less impressed with what we can do and much more reliant on what God can do. Amen. We need to be spiritually minded and we need to be spiritually aware of Satan's tactics because we recognize Whenever there is a spirit of revival or God is flaming fire in the hearts of his people, that Satan works overtime to hinder revival. Satan is not going to come physically into a body of believers, the way that I mentioned in that joke, to break up revival. Because it really doesn't work that way. Satan uses a variety of age-old tactics that have worked for thousands of years. And if we're not careful, Satan can really get into our mind and into our heart and roadblock revival in our own life. That's what I want to talk about tonight, I want to, uh, this morning. I want to talk about real revival. And what things that Satan uses to try to prevent God from being able to do everything that he wants to do in your life. That really is revival at its core. That God would be able to do what he wants to do in your life. We sing a song, it goes like this. Let the Lord have his way in your life every day. There's no rest, there's no peace until the Lord has his way. Place your life in his hands, rest assured in his plan, let the Lord, let the Lord have his way. That's revival. When somebody comes 
to a church service and maybe they've announced that there's going to be revival meetings, those special speakers, they don't pack revival up in a luggage and bring it to church. Because that's not how revival works. Revival is a working of God. A working of God in our own minds and in our own hearts. And I believe if God is going to do revival in, in my life. If God is going to bring revival to your heart. There are some things that we can do to spiritually prepare ourselves for that. The word of God needs to fall on fertile soil. Jesus gave a very clear parable about different kinds of soil. And we won't take the time to go through that parable, but Jesus said very specifically that the seed is the word of God. And so this morning, in this service, uh, we didn't put it in the bulletin and we didn't throw a little tile on Facebook. Revival services at Roger City Baptist Church today. But did you know today can be a revival in your heart? In your heart. When you draw a circle around yourself and you say to yourself, God, I am emptying myself of me and I want you to fill me with you. God, I want to let go of the things that I hang on to and I want to make myself moldable, yieldable, available to you and what you want to do in my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, that is revival. When God's man is able to plow and to sow seed, that's a wonderful thing, but I have to say that fields need to be prepared and ready. And I want to ask you this morning if... God wants to do revival and he wants to do a work in your heart. You say, God wants to meet with me? Absolutely. More than you understand or even realize, God wants to meet with you right now. But is your heart prepared and ready for him? We're not going to go out in the parking lot and cast seed. That's not going to do anything. And according to the parable, the only thing that's going to happen in the wayside is the birds are going to come, they're going to snatch up the seed and nothing grows. But for that to happen, we need God to do some work in our life. We need to maybe pull out some stumps and clear out some rocks out of the way. And these are things that begin this preparation for revival. And I'm going to talk about two things in particular. Sherry said, David, remember, uh, we're starting uh, going back to tender care or Medilodge this week. She said, uh, I'm hoping that services can move along so that we can hit the target. We have to be at Metalodge at a certain time, and it's right after the morning service. And God's people said, amen, you get off the hook. But we're going to look at two things this morning after we pray. I'm going to ask Brother Pittman if he'll lead us to prayer and ask the Lord if he would really make us this morning open, available for what he wants to do in our heart. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time. Lord, we ask that you make our hearts open to hear from your precious Holy Spirit and your word, that the idea that you have taught in your word of revival might fill our hearts and lives. Lord, that we might not just talk about it, but experience it in this time. We ask that you give Brother Rogers the words to preach and the unction from on high. In Jesus' name, amen. Notice verse number four in our passage. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Notice the turn us. And that's what revival is. It's a turning back. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? And he's talking specifically how God's people had been in a period of time where God was punishing or chastising or chastening his people. He was chastising them because of their sin. And he's saying, Lord, we want to turn to you again. We recognize that we have done wrong. We recognize that we have sinned. But now we're at that place where we want to turn back to you. We want to line ourselves up with you again. We're asking you to forgive us for our sin. We recognize our sin. And now we're asking for you to deal with us again. And that's what 
the psalmist here is saying specifically in verse number six, that's what bridges into it. Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Mark it big and bold that God's people do not rejoice unless God is working in their heart. Mark it down. Say, I have no reason to rejoice. <laughs> oh, you do. But when God begins to work in your heart, then you find that rejoicing. The two things that I said I would talk about today is, first of all, there are things that work against revival. And one of the things that works against revival is, and I want you to say it with me, it's a short little word, easy for you to say, the word is denial. Would you say that? Denial. We joke a little bit and say that denial is not a river in Egypt. Would somebody go catch the door? There's somebody that's trying to get in. I'm not sure what the deal is, but uh, uh, somebody's trying to get in. One of the enemies to revival is, say the word with me, denial. And here's the statement. I don't need revival. <laughs> I don't need reviving. One of the biggest hindrances to revival is an attitude of denial. <laughs> oh, thank the Lord that pastor preached that message. You know, I've been thinking about so-and-so, and I've been thinking, boy, something needs to be done. Something needs to be said. I'm so thankful that pastor saw that, and he preached that message, and I hope they heard that. And I hope it makes a change in their life. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not an attitude of revival. One of the biggest hindrances to revival is an attitude of denial, saying, I don't need revival, and it's probably one of the greatest hurdles to overcome in this matter of revival. The enemy of denial. The church in Laodicea say, said this, Because thou sayest, I am rich. That's Revelation 3.17. I am rich, increased with goods. I have need of nothing. They said, we're good. We have what we need. The bills are paid. The, the building is air conditioned. Everything is clean. I got my good Sunday suit on. My suit is pressed. I got a nice car to come into church. And everything is good. And they said, we have need of nothing. And God said, I want to give you a view of how I see you, not how you see yourself. Because what you see in the mirror as you look back at yourself may be something different than what God sees. He said, thou knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And God was telling the church in Laodicea, you may think you have arrived, but friend, you are missing the boat. Revival. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I've had people tell me this. And not recently. I'm not trying to shoot at anybody. You know, I don't know why pastor preached that message. I don't know why pastor preached that message. I'll be honest with you. I'm ADHD. Sometimes I don't know why I preached that message. Because he told me to. And that person that says, I'm good is the person sometimes that doesn't know that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Samson had been totally stripped from Holy Spirit power. Judges 16, 20, and she said, and he's talking to Samson here, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep. <laughs> That's like some folks getting ready to, uh, for the offering time at church. They're like, okay, <laughs> time to go home. Here's what Samson said. I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not, that means he knew not, that the Lord had departed from him. And there's some folks sitting in church. There's some folks spiritually. They're going about day-to-day -day life. I call them ho-hum Christians. And they have no concept that the Spirit of God has been lifted off of them. You wonder why God doesn't tug at your heart when the message is preached? Samson had been stripped of the Holy Spirit power, had no idea. And I've watched church folks for years. Because revival is not a clear-cut, simple, one-word thing. Revival is different to many different people, and I hope you're listening. A plant that is starting to wither and gets watered comes back when it's revived. 
Uh, somebody gave us a little tomato plant, poor tomato plant. They had no idea when they said, Pastor, will you take this home? That was like sentenced to death. <laughs> and it was outside for a little bit, and I, I watered it a couple times. And then my wife moved in to rescue. Sentenced to death. Okay, so the plant is now sitting in our kitchen window, the little window that looks out to the backyard. And it's getting watered a little bit, but it's not happy. And whoever gave us the plant, I think their tomato plants are like this, and this thing hasn't changed really at all in size. And a little water is really not going to fix what this plant needs. Sometimes revival means a plant that's starting to wither gets watered and it is revived. Sometimes it means a field that is plowed under and gets re-sown is revived. God is able to do whatever needs to be done in your heart, no matter what level of revival you need. Some people faint and smelling salts makes them come too. Some people need a defibrillator. I mean, they don't, you know, clear and put the paddles on. That's what they need to bring them back. Some people need a slap on the face. Others need a shot of adrenaline. And the Holy Spirit is so wise in knowing what we need. God can do it. He knows exactly what your heart needs if your heart is growing cold toward the Lord. A person that has simply gotten cold needs revival. A person that has ended up in their life habits in the hog pen needs revival. A person that attends church but doesn't pay attention needs revival. A person that has gotten completely out of church needs revival. A new convert that may be dealing with some distractions in the Christian life needs revival. And so does an older saint that at times deals with discouragement. But here's one of the biggest enemies to revival. Say the word with me. Denial. Say the word with me. Denial. When you say, I don't need revival. Listen up. Here's another thing that becomes a hindrance to revival. Doubt. Would you say that word with me? Doubt. Doubt is an enemy to revival. While denial says, I don't need revival, doubt says, I can't have revival. I am too far from revival. I want to remind you this morning that revival is a divine work and God can do anything. Listen to what the scripture says. Will thou not... Revive us again. The psalmist here is not saying, boy, we're going to really fire it up. We're going to fire some things up. Boy, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. And we're just going to really get cranking for Jesus. Oh, no. Because revival doesn't come from us. Revival comes from him. Revival is a divine work and God can do anything. Jesus told the disciples, he said, well, with men, some things aren't possible. He said, but with God, all things are possible. One of the most effective lies of Satan that rivals this uh, thing of denial, I don't need revival, is our thinking that I am too far gone or there's too much. Uh, I've heard somebody told me this this week. Pastor, there's just too much water under the bridge. But too much has happened in my life. You may have come to accept Satan's lie that you'll never be spiritual or that you could never have an intimate walk with God. But God can do it. Amen. God can do it. I want to show you some incredible examples of what God can do in this matter of revival. You're going to take your Bibles and open them to the book of Ezekiel. Chapter number 37, the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 37. If you want to just put a little marker where we're at there in the book of Psalms, that's fine. But I'd like you to find the book of Ezekiel, and I'm going to find it with you. And I realize sometimes that I'm not uh, patient enough to wait for you to find scripture, and I apologize for that. Sometimes I even have them printed out, and that's cheating on a big level, isn't it? 
I already have it printed out. Uh, Sherry said, uh, David, sometimes uh, we're just looking for it, and you start reading it. And uh, so there, I'm looking it up with you. Ezekiel chapter number 37. Here the prophet uh, speaking a message to God's people. Ezekiel chapter 37. If you have a Schofield Bible, the number is 881. 881. And uh, the hand of the Lord was upon me. Carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. <laughs> There's no life in bones. There's not even the potential. You can't even, you can't even use a defibrillator on bones. Uh, it would just be totally preposterous. And caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there are very many in the open valley. And lo, they were very dry. Not just bones, but they're in a long state of death and just there's no life. And he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? Well, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is, of course not. Of course not. And I answered, oh, Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, oh, very dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Now, look right up here. Let's just be real honest with ourselves to understand what's happening here. God is telling Ezekiel, I want you to preach to these dead bones. Now, if you're a Baptist pastor, you're accustomed to this. Like, like Lord, <laughs> try bones. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and bring upon flesh on you and cover you with skin and put breath into you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and I prophesied and there was a noise and behold a shaking and the bones came together bone to bone. And when I beheld lo the sinew and the flesh came upon them the skin that covered them above but there was no breath in them. Then said he prophesy to the wind prophesy son of man and say to the wind thus saith the Lord God. Come from the four winds, O breath, breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. And I am telling you this morning on the word of the Lord that God told this man, Ezekiel, to preach to the dry bones, and the dry bones, they got flesh on them, tendons, and then there, there were just a heap of bodies. But then God said the wind, he commanded that wind to come in, and they stood up, a mighty army for God. Say, why are you saying that this morning? I am saying, if you spiritually have found yourself in a dry place and you've been there a long time, you've gotten to the point where you say, there's no life here. I'm just spiritually in a desert. This is the way it's going to be. Friend, I'm telling you that God can revive you. Amen. That's what God can do. That's what God can do. In Job 14 and verse 7, the Bible says, For there is hope of a tree, if it be cut down, that it will sprout again, that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root therefore wax old in the earth, and the stock die therefore in the ground, yet though the scent of water, it will bud and bring forth boughs like a plant. God said if spiritually your tree is chopped off, and the root dies and that stump dries out yet when he rains on it he can make you sprout new life again man that's so hopeful to me that's so hopeful in the book of first uh, kings chapter number 17 i'll not look there but the bible speaks of a dead son that was raised to life in the book of 2 Kings chapter number 13 verse number 20. And Elisha died and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land in the coming year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man. Happened to be it was in the same spot where they had buried Elisha. Behold they spied a band of men and they cast a man in the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha. He revived and stood to his feet. And you say Please, dear Lord, when they bury my mother-in-law, let it not be in the grave of a prophet. Just let her be. Rest in peace. And we're just being a little facetious, but I want you to see this. It wasn't Elisha. It wasn't Elisha that revived that, lay, that person to life again. It was the Lord God. 
And those may seem like some extreme examples, but when we fall prey to the victim, uh, to this mentality of doubt, and we say to ourselves, I can't have revival. I want you to be reacquainted with what God can do. Revival, what is it? Oh, that's a week when a uh, pastor announces it. We put something in the bulletin and say, we're going to have revival meeting. I've been through some weeks of revival meeting where God met with God's people. I've been through some weeks of revival meetings, talking about revival meetings, where absolutely nothing happened. Because revival is not necessarily just a slot on the calendar. While I appreciate the emphasis and the preparation of the man of God and the people of God, what brings revival is when you understand, number one, I need revival. Number two, revival is possible in my heart. I need revival. I don't want you to say it out loud, but would you say it in your heart? I'm going to say it again. I need revival. Revival at Roger City Baptist Church does not begin in this building. It begins in your heart. Lifetime of labor is still worth.